The United Kingdom has put hard numbers behind a renewed commitment to heavy armor, listing 288 Challenger II main battle tanks in Army holdings as of April 1, 2025, up from 219 a year earlier. The figure appears in the annual equipment statistics released on October 30, 2025 and immediately changes the conversation about British land power. On paper, the Army has recovered mass after a decade defined by attrition, cannibalization and hard choices. Yet the same release also invites a more sober reading. The tally describes total inventory rather than the smaller pool of vehicles that could deploy on short notice, and that distinction will define how much of this apparent resurgence translates into real combat power for NATO and for the UK's own contingency plans. The path to 288 was neither linear nor effortless. Over the past several years, heavy armor suffered from aging platforms, deferred overhauls and supply chains that struggled to deliver spares at tempo. The early wartime donation of Challenger 2s to Ukraine, politically compelling and strategically coherent, exposed those vulnerabilities further by pulling deployable vehicles out of already thin fleets. The 2025 number therefore reflects both a policy decision to retain a credible armored force and a practical effort to return stored hulls, training assets and previously cannibalized vehicles to the books. London is signaling that armor remains central to deterrence in Europe's new era of high-intensity planning, even as the army undertakes the harder work of restoring readiness. Inventory, however, is not the same as availability. In 2023, British sources assessed that roughly 150 to 160 Challenger IIs were fit for combat tasks, a reminder that paper fleets often hide maintenance backlogs and manpower bottlenecks. The headline total includes vehicles in storage, in deep maintenance, or set aside for training in spares harvesting. The strategic significance of 288 will therefore hinge on how many of those tanks can be kept in an operational state month after month, not merely surged for an exercise or a photo opportunity. NATO planners care about sustained readiness, crew currency and logistics endurance, because it is availability, not mere possession that decides how many squadrons can move to the Alliance's frontier and stay there through rotations, weather and attrition. Technically, the Challenger 2 remains a formidable survivability package. Its dorchester slash chobham derived armor and battle-proven fire control have historically made it a tough opponent in urban and mixed terrain, with crews praising its protection in the Balkans and Iraq. That strength, however, coexists with a design choice that has grown costly over time, the 120mm L30A1 rifled gun. While accurate and lethal with bespoke ammunition, it isolates the platform from the broad and rapidly evolving ecosystem of NATO 120mm smoothbore rounds now standard across Leopard 2 and Abrams fleets. In an era of commonality, interoperability and industrial surge, ammunition compatibility is not a minor detail, it shapes training pipelines, multinational stockpiles and unit lethality under coalition command. The solution is already in motion. The Challenger 3 program, launched in 2021, will convert 148 Challenger 2s to a new standard with a completely redesigned turret mounting Rainmetal's 120mm L55 smoothbore gun, modern day slash night sights, a digital architecture and an active protection system. Industrial delivery is anchored by Rainmetal BAE Systems Land, with an award of around £800 million securing turret manufacture in the UK and refurbishment of existing hulls. This is more than a technical refresh. It reintegrates Britain into the mainstream NATO ammunition supply chain, narrows the firepower gap with the latest Leopard 2 variants and prepares crews for the sensors, software and survivability aids that define contemporary armoured combat. If conversion cadence holds, Challenger 3 will turn a numerically restored fleet into one that is also credible in lethality and growth. The European context matters because armor is being revalued across the continent. Germany is moving its Leopard 2s to A7-A8 standards with upgraded sensors and defensive suites, Poland is building mass through a blend of Leopard 2, K2, and M1A2 SEPV-3 the United States continues to fund Abrams upgrades that preserve industrial capacity. 
Against these benchmarks, Britain's comparative strengths lie in protection, cruise survivability and the institutional experience of expeditionary operations. Its weaknesses, limited ammunition commonality and constrained upgrade headroom, are precisely what the Challenger 3 pathway aims to correct. The new British numbers therefore do two things at once, they reassure allies that London will remain a framework nation with tangible heavy forces, and they buy time to field a modernized core that can integrate seamlessly with partners. Numbers and upgrades alone will not close the readiness gap. Through life support will decide how many tanks are actually fieldable in any given quarter. That means predictable funding for spares, robust repair capacity, diagnostic tooling and data, and a manpower model that retains artisans as well as crews. It also means adequate ammunition for training and war stocks, since the credibility of an armored unit depends on lit-fire cycles and tactical proficiency as much as on the metal itself. Inflationary pressure across defense supply chains, competition for skilled labor, and the parallel responsibility to continue aiding Ukraine will all test Britain's ability to turn ledger strength into operational punch. The lesson from 2023, when deployable numbers lagged far behind inventory, should concentrate minds on availability metrics, not press lines. Politically, the message is clear. London wants allies, especially on NATO's eastern flank, to understand that the UK is not divesting heavy armor to finance other priorities, it is restructuring and rearming it. Declaring an inventory of 288 tanks signals depth and intent, stabilizes industrial planning and supports alliance deterrence conversations in the Baltic and Black Sea regions. It also strengthens Britain's voice in discussions about a future European main battle tank. Only countries that can field and sustain credible forces will shape the requirements of the next generation, the rest will be norm-takers rather than norm-setters. A documented, modernizing fleet gives the UK a seat at that table with leverage. For defense watchers, three indicators will determine whether the statistical jump becomes genuine capability. First is the delivery tempo of Challenger 3 conversions and the timeline from factory acceptance to trained, deployable squadrons. Second is steady state availability across the whole fleet, including the portion that remains in Challenger 2 configuration during the transition. Third is the health of the sustainment ecosystem, spares pipelines, maintenance turnaround times, and ammunition throughput, because these are the gears that grind quietly beneath every successful armored deployment. Transparent reporting against these metrics would do more to validate the UK's heavy armor posture than any headline number. The 2025 disclosure should therefore be read as an inflection point rather than a finish line. Britain has restored volume, protected critical industrial skills and charted a coherent path to modernization. If deliveries proceed on schedule, availability rises to NATO-credible levels, and funding for support remains stable alongside continued assistance to Ukraine, the British Army will recover not just mass but staying power. In that scenario, the 288 figure becomes more than accounting, it becomes the foundation for a force that can deploy quickly, integrate with allies and endure the demands of high-intensity warfare. If, on the other hand, sustainment falters or conversion slips, the gap between inventory and usable capability will reopen. The difference between those futures will be measured in workshop bays, training ranges and ammunition depots, not in spreadsheets.